I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about CSS shapes, responsive images, and more. Let's check it out. First up is this wonderful blog post called Getting Started with CSS Shapes. And if you're not familiar, CSS shapes allow you to wrap your content around custom paths. So for example, we have this nice espresso cup and you can see that the text is wrapping right around it. Whoa, what? how are they doing that? Well, the text is an image, right? That's all Photoshop. Exactly. No, actually that's real text. And here you have this image, it says image.ping. And here you have some CSS and it says shape outside, that's the property. And then for the value, it passes the exact same image. So it says, okay, this image or this PNG is going to be our shape and you base that shape off of the alpha transparency, then you say shape image threshold, and that basically defines how much padding you want between the image and your text, and then they just float it to the left, pretty standard stuff there, and the text wraps right around. So that's pretty amazing. There's a couple of other things that you can do. There's some sort of primitive shapes here, the circle and ellipse. So you could define just a circle here if you didn't want to use an image. And you can do that by saying shape outside and using the circle function. And like I said, you can also do an ellipse. I think that's further down here. There we go. So that's what an ellipse might look like. And there's also... Could you make a heart shape? You could, and you could do that with the polygon function. I would, I would rather use an ellipse function. An and ellipse then, function. then it would be the total ellipse of the heart. Nice. Cool. Great, great tips. So here is this polygon function, and this is how you would actually produce a heart shape if you didn't have an image to do it. You can just define the points on your polygon and then you could create something like a square or a rectangle, a triangle, or even something more complicated. Anyway, this is a really great post. There's a lot to dig into with CSS shapes and of course there are some quirks with browser support right now and you should definitely use this as a progressive enhancement to your website. In other words, you should make sure that your website looks good without it. And then if the browser supports it, you could test for it with something like at supports and then actually include it in your site if the browser does support it. Anyway, really great post, uh, a lot of depth there that we didn't get into. So definitely be sure to check that out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, next up, we have a project called Sweet Alert. This is a little JavaScript project that is designed to be a replacement for JavaScript's alert function. So what does it do? Well, let's take a look at the page here. Here is a normal alert. Let's say we had an error message. Go ahead and click on that. Uh-oh, something went wrong. Uh, well, all right, I guess that's okay looking. It's just like Chrome's built-in alert message, whatever. What does this sweet alert look like? Wow, that's pretty sweet, isn't it? That's much better. Yeah, that's much better. Huh? Just click OK there. Look at that. That's so much better. Yeah. Now I like getting error messages. I'm yeah. like, oh, it's OK. The, the whole thing crashed. That's cool. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Just, well, as, long, as long as it looks pretty, functionality doesn't matter. Nice. Uh, so anyway, there's a bunch of different examples here. You, can, you don't need to uh, use just alerts. Uh, you can put messages in here. Uh, also, you can call the sweet alert function, as they do right here, or abbreviate it with SWAL. SWAL? S-W-A. One? S-W-A-L. S-W-A-L. Swal. Sweet alert. Swal. Yeah. That's swal. It's pretty swal. Yeah. Swal. Uh, so you can put more text in it, and you can even have success and failure messages. All right, great job. You click the button. Here's a check mark. Uh, has warnings. Yeah, cancel. All right, whatever. Now delete it. Cool. Deleted my imaginary file. And you can even do something else. You can pass it callbacks uh, for cancellation or confirmation and you are good to go. Also, you can even put custom icons in there like a uh, 
reverse thumbs down. So there we go, custom image alert. Anyway, very easy to use. You can either use Bower to install it or just include the JavaScript and CSS in your page. Note that this does not require jQuery. Very, very small and easy to use. Now you can also have different options, whether or not you want to allow outside clicks or show the cancellation buttons. Ton of different options in here uh, that you can check out. Anyway, that is Sweet Alert. I like it. I think it's pretty sweet. I think it's pretty small. Next up, we have a blog post called Animating Images with CSS Keyframes. Whoa, what the heck does that mean? Well, CSS keyframes allow you to animate things. You can set up your your keyframes and then execute them, and basically something can happen on the page. However, this blog post suggests that you could do it with some images. So let's take a look at the demo to see what that looks like. Here wow. we have this really nice full page background image. So, is that a video? So you can imagine that this is sort of like a blog post, but no, this is actually not a video. If you wanted to do this as a video, you might have to do this entire page, it would take up a lot of bandwidth, or you would have to do something kind of weird and maybe have like a video cutout. It would be kind of messy. This is actually a really nice, elegant solution though, and it ends up with some pretty low file sizes. So let's go back and see how that works. First, you have to find a photo. So they're using this windmill photo. And then in your favorite image editing tool, uh, in this case they're using Photoshop, you can cut out that image. And here's where you'll want to be pretty careful because this is what's going to make it or break it. You want to cut out this windmill here and then you actually maybe want to refine the edge, make sure you get everything looking correct there. And then you've got to erase parts of the image so that you kind of get that background to appear again. And you'll notice that they were even extra clever and removed the little shadow right there so you don't see that. Then all you have to do is set up your code. So you have your windmill background. That's pretty standard stuff. And then you absolute position the windmill images. And you want to make sure that you do this right, otherwise if you it's going to look weird. Maybe resize the browser. It could, you know, move those images around because you're basically building, you're rebuilding the image in layers here. So you want to make sure you do that correctly. And then you end up with uh, something that looks like this. And then you have to set up the animation, of course. And then you get something that looks like this. Uh, it's all pretty standard stuff. It's just kind of an interesting way of recombining. Uh, existing ideas of you know building up layers and animating them and then using images for the animation instead of uh, other elements on the page. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's uh, it, you know it's really neat. It's probably not something that you would do for every blog post you write, but maybe for product images or uh, you know even app demonstrations that could be really useful. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it also only works on a very specific type of image. I mean, you'll notice that those windmills had very thin blades, so it was pretty easy to copy the background and kind of fill in the sky there. Pretty simple to do. If it was like a whole person blocking out most of the background or something, it might be more difficult. But yeah. anyway, uh, pretty cool post. Definitely be sure to check that one out. Remember the dance move called the windmill? I do. Would you like to demonstrate it for us? Maybe a little bit later. Okay. Part of the after show. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Next up, we have an Angular JS tutorial. Now, this is a very comprehensive 10,000 word guide. Whoa. That is so many words. I can't even count that high. But this is actually an amazing introduction and Angular JS tutorial. Now, if you've had trouble working through the official Angular JS tutorial and the documentation, which can be a little bit overwhelming, this is wonderful. The reason I say it's wonderful is because it goes into the background of a lot of the different concepts in a little bit more and at the same time less depth than the documentation, distilling what you need to know about all of the different parts of AngularJS into a few solid paragraphs that really explain everything. So it will go into the concepts behind JavaScript frameworks and why AngularJS became a necessity, and then the engineering behind 
behind it. Like, hey, why do we need single page applications these days? Well, it's because the browser can hold all of the state for us and abstraction makes single, play, single page applications easier to write. So it goes through everything you need to know about Angular, talks a lot about modules and how they work inside of your Angular applications, how to bootstrap your HTML. Did you know that you can bootstrap elements besides just the HTML element for an Angular application? Yes, you can actually have just a small piece of your page be the Angular application instead of the whole thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And did, did you read this guide? I did not, but I know a little bit about Angular. <laughs> Well, if you want to know more, you can check out this guide. Anyway, it goes over everything you need to know, scope, directives, modules, services, factories, the whole nine or 10 yards, 10,000 yards. If 10, a word 10,000 words. If a word is a yard, it goes that many. It's worth yards. It's worth 10,000 words a blog. When all you need is a knife. We're really getting off track here. Yeah. Anyway, check it out. It's in the show notes. Next up is responsive image or RESP image or resp image, it's kind of abbreviated there. It's a responsive images polyfill that loads your images fast and responsibly. And I'm still wondering if they meant to say responsively. responsively. Not sure. We'll never know. That's going to be one of the mysteries of the world there. It's like we finish each other's sentences. Sandwiches. Sam oh, okay. In a different direction there. Uh, it's a fast, lightweight, and robust responsive images polyfill that saves the user's bandwidth by utilizing smart resource selection algorithm. Whoa, what, what? is that? I don't, I don't know, but it's smart, so you should go ahead and just trust it. And basically, it allows you to use two different types of markup examples. One is where you have an image and you use the source set. So maybe you have multiple responsive images that you want to use. And it also supports the picture element format where you have the picture element and then the child elements of source and you specify the source set there. So if you really want to use these responsive image markup techniques and you're using a browser or you're targeting a browser that maybe doesn't necessarily support these things, this is a great polyfill to use to allow that to happen there. Very nice. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for this week. I'm at Nick RP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes below the video and read more about it. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you next week. Thank you.